invite you to turn with me this morning to Psalms 35. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. This morning I'm going to do something that I never have done and don't usually do. I'm going to read out of the clear word, and I do that because I found this morning it's the only Bible I had with me this week. But I checked it, and it's, uh, it, it reads just fine. I like the way Jack Blanco reads, uh, writes, uh, as one man put it, he writes the way I read and I can understand. So Psalms 35, 1 through 3. Lord, fight against those who fight against me. Set yourself against those who have set themselves against me. Take up your shield and armor and come to my rescue. Take your bow and arrows and your war axe and lift them up against those who are pursuing me. And please tell me you will save me. It can be our prayer to this morning, can it? Thank you. We ask that God grant his blessing to his people. Praise God for the privilege of getting to be here. And let's see if I push the right button. Can everybody hear okay? Happy Sabbath. It is good to look out and see each of you here. And I can't resist stretching it a little bit more because last Sabbath, there was a lot of snow on the ground, even though we still had tried to have church. And the week before that, there was ice on the ground. So it is great to have the family here together today to study his word, to praise his name. And have you been blessed already? Yes. Amen. Let's pray once more. Father in heaven, in these next few moments, somehow, could you please work a miracle and make me disappear and it be Jesus that we hear from and see? Because through his word, Lord, we are asking that you touch our hearts and that your power leave us changed as we leave this service today. Thank you. In Christ's name, amen. We just listened to the words in Psalms 35. And while we listen to verses 1 through 3, if you drop down to verse 9, the Bible says, My soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in His salvation. Heard a neat story this week. Uh, perhaps you've heard it already. If so, uh, it bears repeating. Perhaps you haven't. And it certainly bears hearing. There is a lady in our district who during the uh, time of the snow and ice left her apartment to go and check her mail. And there's ice on it. Well, I'm getting a signal to double check the microphone. All right. Does that help? We've got to have power, amen? And there was a sign that I should have seen, but it had to come from the front row. Thank you for giving me a signal that ends up helping all the rest of us. Does that mean I need to back up and repeat everything that was just said? Okay, if somebody didn't catch it, by all means check with somebody that did and you can help pass along. Because God is an amazing God. And my prayer today as we open his word is just like this lady, as she went out of her apartment, she made it about halfway to the mailbox to check her mail and she realized her shoes were freezing in the sub-zero temperatures to the ice. And she statue panicked. 
You understand what I mean? She suddenly froze. She couldn't go forward to check her mail. She wasn't literally froze yet, but in a few seconds or minutes, she very well could have been. She was afraid to back up and get to safety, and so the only thing she could do was just stand there. At that precise moment, a man shows up with a snow shovel and says, ma'am, I'm here to help you. Uh, You need to get back to your apartment, and I have this snow shovel here, and I'm going to shovel you a path so that you can get safely back to your apartment. Well, she began to fuss at him and said, no, I need to get my mail. He said, don't worry about your mail. I'll bring it to you. Let's get you inside where it's warm. And and so he helped her back to her apartment and then took his snow shovel and shoveled the rest of the way out to uh, to the mailbox and then brought her mail back to her. And somebody here is smiling and says, I bet I could finish the story. She turned around to thank him. There wasn't anybody to thank. Now, I'll let you draw your own conclusions, but brothers and sisters, we serve an amazing God. A little bit later, one of her relatives came to check on her. Driving this SUV, pulls into the parking lot and somehow gets stuck in the parking lot. Would you be surprised if a man suddenly appeared? with a snow shovel and gave her precise instructions and shoveled the snow out from around her tires and helped her get unstuck and told her where to pull so she wouldn't get stuck again. And when she turned around to thank him, nobody there. Do we serve an amazing God? Does he care about you? Absolutely. Absolutely. But there's another verse that builds on what we're reading here in Psalms that takes us some... Let's go to the book of John. And notice with me John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse 32. John chapter 12 verse 32. Jesus is speaking and he says simply in John 12 verse 32, And I... If I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Brothers and sisters, I hope we hear in this verse a call to the foot of the cross. Because it is coming in faith to Jesus and gazing upon His faith, listening to His Word that does something inside of us that can happen no other way. My words don't have any power, but God's Word does. God's Word has exactly what we need to be braced and encouraged and transformed so that we can spend eternity with God in heaven. Brothers and sisters, as I listen to this verse, I'm reminded of another appeal from Jesus. And perhaps it fits you this morning. Matthew chapter 11 listening to Jesus' appeal, calling us to the foot of the cross. And by the way, what we just read in John, is that talking about Jesus being crucified? Absolutely. The sacrifice He made on the cross is what becomes our salvation. Oh, but is it still true today? The more we talk about Jesus, the more we come into His presence, the more that we receive His touch and power. Mm, Let's listen to Jesus here in Matthew 11. Notice in verse 28, He says simply, Come unto Me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take My yoke upon you and learn of Me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light I heard another story this week about some young people right here in our own church and they went outside and they found a whole bunch of snow anybody here enjoyed playing in the snow 
Thank you. I feel so much better. I saw a bunch of hands go. I was afraid to ask that question. I, th- I thought somebody would say, oh, no, we didn't like the snow. We're so glad it's gone. Thank you for raising your hands. It was so much fun. No, I am glad it's off the roadways and the temperatures are warmer. If we could have 70 degrees and snow on the ground, I think I'd go for that. But uh, at any rate, they, they decided they would build an, a snow fort. So they get their sled and they go down to the bottom of the hill and, and they load it all up onto their sled and then they pull it up the hill and then they pack it into these five gallon buckets and they begin to make bricks to build a snow fort. And then they figured out how to make a roof for it. And it turned into an igloo rather than a fort. And so they even made a bench inside there where you could, uh, could stretch out and take a, take a nap. And so I, I drove past early this week and it was amazing to see it. But brothers and sisters, it's not there anymore. It's gone. It caved in and now even the cave in is gone. Why? It melted! And yet in that simple illustration, my friends, is exactly what Jesus is appealing to us to remember. The only way that our lives can be built and survive the craziness of the world we are in is to be in constant communication with Him. Uh, uh, Some of you at Sabbath school sang the song, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll... Grow, grow, grow. And, and I realize the reverse of that, uh, the word's supposed to be shrink, but I think it would be more fitting to use the word melt, wouldn't it? If I neglect the Bible, if I forget to pray, I will start to melt, melt, melt. But Jesus is appealing to us today, whatever is stressing you out, whatever heartaches you are bearing, whatever challenges you're facing, He wants us to come to the foot of the cross and let Him carry them for us. There's a uh, passage written by the pen of inspiration that caught my attention this week. My intentions were to end our time together by reading it, but as I look at the clock, it seems like we should start there. And if you would listen with me, maybe it will touch your heart as much as it touched mine, but but it comes from the devotional book, Ye Shall Receive Power. I like that title. Ye Shall Receive Power. Ever been in a car or a truck and wished it had more power? Ever felt like at the end of the day I wished I had more power? Ever felt that Satan was harassing you and you wished you had more spiritual power? God longs to give it to us. And reading from this week's, uh, the, 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 the nugget came from Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. So please keep your finger there. And notice the, the following words. While you have been walking in meekness and lowliness of heart, a work has been going on for you. We heard last week how much energy heaven is expending so that our lives can be transformed to spend eternity with God in heaven. God is working for you. A work which only God could do. For it is God that worketh in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. And that good pleasure is to have you abide in Christ. Abide in Christ. Rest in His love. You must not let anything rob your soul of peace, of restfulness, 
of the assurance that you are accepted just now. Appropriate every promise. All are yours on condition of your complying with the Lord's prescribed terms. Well, what are those? Continuing. You ready? Got your seatbelts fastened? Ready? The terms are entire surrender of your ways. Now the next part caught me off guard and I have to confess I said ouch. Because there's a comma, not a period. And then it continues, it says, which seems so very wise. Am I the only one that has woke up in the morning and planned out what I thought would be a very productive, wonderful day? And then realized God had a completely different plan? And I'm starting to fuss with God. God, but I'm, I want to follow you with my plan. It doesn't work so well. He wants us to surrender to His plan. Entire surrender of your ways, which seems so very wise, and taking Christ's ways is the secret of perfect rest in His love. Giving up one's life to Him means much more than we suppose. We must learn His meekness and lowliness before we realize the fulfillment of the promise, ye shall find rest unto your souls. And then here's where the title of today's study comes from. It is by learning the habits of Christ. His meekness, His lowliness, that self becomes transformed by taking Christ's yoke upon you and then submitting to learn. Now this next sentence is another one of those that I would invite you to ponder very carefully. I'm going to personalize it. Ross has much to learn. Oh, Miss Esther has much to learn. You get the drift? Sister Joy has much to learn. Now, now, now I'm not picking on anybody because of the, the way it's written here, it simply says there is no one who has not much to learn. So Garrett's got a bunch to learn. He's bright in school, but he's still got a lot to learn. Every one of us stand in need of learning. Watch this. There is no one who has not much to learn. All must come under the training by Jesus Christ. When they fall upon Christ, their own hereditary and cultivated traits of character are taken away as hindrances to their being partakers of the divine nature. When self dies, then Christ lives in the human agent. He abides in Christ and Christ lives in him. Christ desires All. All. Every person. All. Doesn't matter if you're visiting here today. It doesn't matter if you come every week. It doesn't matter if you're a charter member or if this is your first time in a church. God desires all. He longs for all to come under training. By Jesus Christ. Jesus desires all to become his students. Isn't that neat? A student of Jesus Christ. Are you willing? 
Can we make an appeal right now, even though we're not finished? Are you willing to say, yes, Jesus, I want to be your student. I want you to teach me the lessons that you want me to learn. Here's what happens when we do that. Christ desires all to become his students. He says, yield yourselves to my training. Submit your souls unto me. I will not extinguish you, but will work out for you such a character that you shall be transferred from the lower school to the higher grade. If I'm understanding that right, you and I are in elementary school. It's called planet Earth. We're all in God's elementary school. And if we are willing to be His students and allow Him through the power of His Word to teach us the lessons that we need to learn, He wants to promote us to a higher grade. What would we call that? Heaven. I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of this old world. There's too much pain. There's too much suffering. There's too much heartache. There's there's too many problems. And quite frankly, God is far more anxious to have us with Him than to see this continue to prolong. But in His love and in His mercy, He gives us time to pass our classes so that we can go with Him to heaven. What a God we serve. If we wrap this nugget up, I will not extinguish you, but will work out for you such a character that you shall be transferred from the lower school to the higher grade. Submit all things to me. Let my life, my patience, my long-suffering, my forbearance, my weakness, my lowliness be worked out in your character as one that abides in me. Then you have the promise. Not only I will give, But ye shall find rest unto your souls. Now I realize we should be preparing to sing the closing song and we haven't even dived into the four stories that I wanted us to look at in Scripture. But with that foundation, can we grab one? Let's go to Matthew 19 for just a moment. Can we go into overtime? Is that okay? Matthew 19. Matthew chapter 19. Notice with me if we start about verse 13. Matthew chapter 19 starting in verse 13. Matthew chapter 19 and starting in verse 13, the Bible says, let me make sure I turn, did I turn it back on? If I can hear okay? No. Let's try that again. Get to be in such a hurry and I don't press the button properly. Is there a lesson we can learn there? Slow down. Let God teach us. Yesterday, had the privilege of driving down a dirt road. Mr. Ritchie can vouch for this story. Because as we're driving down the dirt road, it gets to a narrow spot. There's not room for two cars. And there's a car coming. And we had room, so we pulled over to let the other car pass. And the neighbors had two big dogs. And those dogs thought we were stopping to say hello. So they came and they jumped up on the side that uh, Richie was sitting on. And to this moment, you can still see paw prints. Uh, Muddy paw prints right there where they were uh, looking in the window and saying, Hello, thanks for stopping. And it hits me. In a very crude, falls way short sense. We are watching through that simple illustration what can happen to all of us when we stop and ask Jesus to connect with us. It requires slowing down. It requires listening. 
and letting Him leave His mark on us. But let's go back to Matthew 19. In, in verse 13 it says, Then were brought unto Him little children. That, that Jesus should put His hands on them and pray and, and the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto Me. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. It's fun to study the stories in the Gospels. And if you're taking notes, this story is not only in Matthew 19, it's also in Mark 10, it's also in Luke 18. And it's fun to compare the, this, the, this, the story in the Gospels with the commentary in Desire of Ages. And I would encourage you to, to check out that chapter. But because it describes the story of a mom who had a concern on her heart for her kid. Little baby. And she wanted to bring that baby to Jesus. And have Jesus lay His hands on that baby and bless it. I think it's safe to ask any parent or grandparent here, how many of you want God to touch your kids? Uh, And here's this mom, and can you picture her walking past down the road, and another mom sees her and says, "Uh, uh, hey, what you doing? And of course the answer is, I'm headed to find Jesus and want him to bless my kid. And the mom said, well, can I come with you? And that repeats several times as they go down the neighborhood lane. And they, uh, by the time they come to Jesus, there's not just babies in that group. There's uh, there's toddlers. There's there's kids. Uh, uh, there's there's maybe even the kids would calling them kids would be an insult to them because they're getting older. And yet their parents are bringing them to Jesus. And here they come into the presence of Jesus, and the disciples think that they are helping God out by saying, oh, He's too busy for you. But God's aware of the whole story as it's unfolding. Jesus is not caught off guard and He replies, suffer the little children and and forbid them not to come unto Me for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And, And as Jesus blesses these children, Desire of Ages says the mothers are comforted. They return to their homes strengthened and blessed by the words of Christ. They were encouraged to take up their burden with new cheerfulness, to work hopefully for their children. And then Desire of Ages brings it down to 2021. The mothers of today are to receive His words with the same faith. Christ is as verily a personal Savior today as when He lived a man among men. He is as verily the helpers of mothers today as when He gathered the little ones to His arms in Judea. And we could add moms and grandmas and even dads and grandpas because He is longing to transform families by His power. But please don't miss this nugget that talks specifically about kids. And I'm glad we've got a nice group of boys and girls and teenagers. We're all God's kids, so really none of us are left out. But notice this, uh, this next uh, few sentences. The children of our hearths are as much the purchase of His blood as were the children of long ago. In the children who are brought in contact with Jesus, Jesus saw. Jesus saw the men and women who should be heirs of His grace and subjects of His kingdom. And some who would become martyrs for God's sake. Did you catch that? God looks at Sarah and he sees exactly what he can do through her 
for his kingdom. You plug your own name in there. God sees Tanner. God sees you, whatever age you are, and what he wants to do in us and through us to his glory. But it goes on. He knew that these children would listen to him and accept him as their redeemer far more readily than would grown-up people, many of whom were the worldly wise and hard-hearted. In his teaching, Jesus came down to their level. He The majesty of heaven did not disdain to answer their questions and simplify his important lessons to meet their childish understanding. He planted in their minds the seeds of truth, which in after years would spring up and bear fruit unto eternal life. It is still true that children are the most susceptible to the teachings of the gospel and their hearts are open to divine influences and strong to retain the lessons received. Isn't that awesome? God loves kids of every age. Matthew 19, and I realize the clock's saying we'll have to pick this up on a different uh, week, but Matthew 19 tells the story of a grown-up whose heart was so stirred by Jesus' encounter with the kids that he came and wanted the same blessing. But Jesus unpacked some things to him that he didn't realize and wasn't real anxious to hear. And it's a story that we would do well to explore. Maybe next time we will get to continue that. You could this afternoon, couldn't you? So please dig out Desire of Ages, check out the chapter on the kids, and then the next chapter is The Rich Young Ruler. Check out Matthew 19, the rest of the story. But my prayer today, as we're listening to how God can use any of us who are willing to allow Him to build His habits in our heart. Just last evening, I had the privilege of attending a Friday sundown worship. There were several kids in there. One of them came over and handed me a bookmark. It says, I love Jesus. Isn't that cool? But then uh, 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 another one raised their hand and said, memory verse. So I'm thinking they're going to recite a memory verse. What's the shortest verse in the Bible, maybe? Jesus wept, yeah. But now, four years old. They started to recite a Bible verse that we need to hear this morning. I'm stalling on telling you where it's found because as soon as I do, you're going to recognize it. But it starts out, and I saw another angel fly In the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. If you know it, feel free to say it with me. To preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Now right there, that would have been one good memory verse. But it kept going. Saying with a loud voice, 
fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. What do we nickname these two verses? The first angel's message. And that would be a phenomenal passage for a little four-year-old to recite, but it didn't stop there. Let me keep reading what he was quoting. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's a big word for a four-year-old to be getting out of his mouth. But, but what do we nickname that? The second angel's message. Is that a message we need to be studying and understanding today? Absolutely. And then it continues in verse 9. Excuse me. In verse in verse 9, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast at his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. That's the verse he was still working on and got most of the way through. But brothers and sisters, what's the nickname for that passage? The third angel's message. And my dear friends, as we listen to the urgency that is conveyed in those three angels crying loudly, it's because God wants us to realize the seriousness of the time we're living in. Now is not a time to wait till tomorrow to surrender our hearts to Him. Now is not a time for otherworldly considerations to be our first priority. Jesus longs to have us surrender our all to Him. And so in reality, where we started this morning in Matthew 11 is the same call these angels are giving. Jesus is saying, come to me. Let me teach you my habits. Let me give you true rest. Are you willing to answer that call? He spread out his arms on Calvary's cross for me, for you. He does not want us to delay. He's calling us right now are you willing to say yes lord take me i want to be completely yours i want to live my life practicing the habits of jesus father in heaven there's so much more that we could be looking at but right now we're asking for you to do that work in us that you long to do. To give us peace. To give us power. And to help us live for you. Until you come to take us home. In Jesus name. Amen.
Father in heaven, that song is our prayer today. As we lead this service, may your comfort, your peace, your power make us a brand new person in you. If there's somebody who needs to say, yes, Lord, may during this prayer we echo those simple words just now. Thank you for meeting here with us today. And please go with us as we lead this service. In Christ's name, amen.